to you now and tell you why we have this lecture in honor of Robert Harris. Barbara, please. Thank you. The mic doesn't seem to be on. I'm assuming that's okay and that I can be heard. All right. I'll start with a very loud voice and somebody will make the sound happen. As a member of the Board of the Alliance for the Study of the Holocaust and Genocide, it's an honor to be introducing the Robert L. Harris Memorial Lecture and providing background about Robert L. Harris and the community group that supports this unique course. Robert Harris was a World War II vet who retired and moved with his wife, Claire, to Sonoma County after a distinguished career in school teaching and administration, which included directing a school for troubled youth. He became active in the Jewish community and, dedicate, and decided that a contribution he could make was to ensure that students at all levels were educated about the Holocaust. An annual Warsaw Ghetto Uprising Remembrance event had been done for years by a group in Petaluma, which then became an annual Yom HaShoah commemoration. The group included Simon Jaffe and Joe Rappaport, who'd emigrated from Europe and were in the US during World War II, and Irv Newman, who had been coordinating the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising event. At the Yom HaShoah event held at the SSU Commons in 1983, and I realized next year I might have to explain to everybody what the Commons was. <laughs> the university president, Peter Dimondopoulos, was the keynote speaker. After the event, he challenged Robert, who was that year's coordinator, to do more than just memorialize the Holocaust annually in an event. And that began the university community partnership. Part of the justification for founding the group was training teachers. It soon became apparent that SSU was an ideal place for a permanent program about the Holocaust. Professor John Steiner, a Holocaust survivor and professor of sociology, had begun to teach classes that dealt with issues related to the Holocaust. In addition, Paul Benko, a Holocaust survivor, was a faculty member in the biology department, and George Jackson, a liberator, was a faculty member in the psychology department. During the spring of 1983, Robert Harris asked a number of people, including Professor Benko, to assist him in responding to the president's challenge. One of the first was Joel Newberg, who was working at the Holocaust Library and Research Center in San Francisco, which had been established by survivors in 1978. The center had sponsored lectures, but not a consistent program. He also invited Sylvia Sucker, a retired teacher who'd recently moved to the area from New York. She knew Robert's wife, Claire, through her volunteer work with Hadassah. One of Professor Steiner's first students, Virgil Miller, who'd been attending the Warsaw Ghetto Memorial events, was also invited to join that initial group. Kind of wish I was a fly on the wall. Robert also added ministers, rabbis, and people like Evelyn Evie Sackler, another of Professor Steiner's students, Eugene Kravis, Irv Newman, and another local survivor, Walter Kuttner. Sylvia Sucker remembers Robert Harris as an indefatigable leader with enormous determination who was able to work with all types of people, an inspiration. As Joel Newberg recalls, Robert was a one-person organization. He knew what needed to be done, how to interface with individuals and groups, and how to handle all the fundraising. He would simply ask people and people would donate. I think we could use his talents. <laughs> the Alliance for the Study of the Holocaust was thus formed in 1983 on behalf of the victims and survivors of the Holocaust and the desire to tell their stories and learn from their experiences. Those who began this collaborative effort between the community and members of the university faculty promised to let the world know of the atrocities that had occurred. The initial intention was primarily to learn the facts, act on them, and never forget. As a result of those efforts, a highly successful lecture series on the Holocaust and genocide, 
now in its 31st year, was created at Sonoma State University. Initially, there were five to six lectures a year. It grew into a general education course that currently enrolls 100 students annually. Professor Steiner became the first director of the Center for the Study of the Holocaust at Sonoma State, and Professor Myrna Goodman, who many of you know, then a returning student working toward her bachelor's degree, was the first student assistant hired by the center. Remember, student assistant jobs have an interesting way of shaping one's career. And I have a great story if you want to talk after the lecture. Almost from its inception, the series has included lectures on other genocides as well as the Holocaust. As a university community partnership, the Alliance Board includes members of the community, university faculty and administrators, and students who participated in the lecture series. Its current mission is to co-sponsor the lecture series, support the Center for the Study of the Holocaust and Genocide in providing programming to the larger community, including secondary education teachers, and to collaborate with other community groups working with issues related to the Holocaust and genocide. In 2010, the name of the Alliance was changed to the Alliance for the Study of the Holocaust and Genocide to reflect its continuing education commitment to include all those affected by genocide. After Robert's death, the members of the Alliance decided to name an annual lecture in this series as a tribute to him and his unswerving dedication and commitment to Holocaust education. We are truly indebted to Robert for his vision and his leadership. One of the things we do each year as part of our remembrance is to also remember the members of our community who have died in the year since we've had the lecture. Today we will re be remembering one survivor who was new to our community and two people who were critical supporters of the work of the Alliance. The first person we're remembering is Robert Marvan, born Marmelstein, who was born in Munchach, Hungary, and was the youngest of three boys. He described his childhood and adolescence as idyllic prior to the arrival of the Nazis. During the war, he was in a forced labor camp. When a commandant asked for a volunteer with medical background, he did so even though he had no training. Because he was able to administer sulfur injections to combat syphilis, he avoided some of the random brutalities of the camps. In his third year of captivity, he became very ill, but was able to escape with two other prisoners as they were being marched to Auschwitz. He met up with troops from the Russian army and rode in front of the first Russian tank that liberated his hometown from the Germans in 1945. Fred credited his survival to both skill and luck. He met his future wife, Regina, at a train station, and in the darkness of night, the two camp survivors hiked over the mountains from what would become the Soviet Union to Austria and from there to Venice, where their son Robert was born. For those of you who've looked at maps, that's quite a distance. Eventually, they emigrated to the United States and settled in Florida, where Fred has a, had a career as a CPA and became the owner of a sheet metal distributorship. He also took a stance against segregation and sat with his family in the designated colored sections of the local shop Walgreens, drank from the colored only water fountains, and sat in the back of the bus. During a neo-Nazi rally, Fred intervened and removed a Nazi flag from the hands of a demonstrator. His son Robert describes him as a humble man with the utmost integrity who is honest to the core of his being. Fred died on January 11th, 2014, at the age of 92. He believed that one's spirit continues to live in those you leave on the earth, and we're moved to have his wife, Regina, and his son, Robert, with us today. We also want to remember two long-term supporters of the lecture series, 
and the Alliance. Howard R. Chuck Harris was the last surviving sibling of Alliance founder Robert L. Harris. Howard was born in Los Angeles and raised in Glendale. He served in the Army in World War II, like his brother, and graduated from UCLA and then Loyola Law School. In 1955, he married Lois Hepps, and they moved to San Diego, where they raised their four sons and one daughter, and he practiced law until his retirement in the 1990s. Howard and his wife Iris were sustaining members of the Alliance, whose support allows us to bring nationally and internationally recognized scholars and artists to speak in this series. He died on January 20th, 2014, at the age of 91. Next person we're remembering is Lil Krulovich, born Lily, in San Francisco in January of 1920. As an infant, her family settled in the Pangrove area. She was a member of a prominent family connected to the history of Jewish chicken ranchers in this area. She had two sons and a daughter and one stepson. Her husband, Elmer, preceded her in death. Lil was a life member and past president of Hadassah, a volunteer women's organization that inspires a passion for and commitment to its partnership with the land and people of Israel, and a lot of good works around medical care. And she was also active in B'nai Israel Jewish Center in Petaluma. She was also a longstanding supporter of the lecture series. She died just a few weeks ago, February 17, 2014 at the age of 94. Each of these, these losses at the end of long and fruitful lives truly diminishes our community. The Alliance would also like to take this opportunity to invite you to this year's community-wide Yom HaShoah commemoration entitled Regeneration, Lessons from the Holocaust on Sunday, April 27th, from 2 to 4 p.m. at the Friedman Center in Santa Rosa. It will include a very compelling video presentation on teen survivor collaborations to address issues of injustice. Copies of the flyer um, will be available to students in section, and there are some copies on the stage for those of you who are our guests. And for those of you who are our guests, if you didn't have a chance to sign in as you came in, we'd sure appreciate it if you'd come down to this makeshift alternative as you leave today, since your signing in helps us in securing money that allows us to bring speakers. Thank you so very much.
myself organized here. I have to put my glasses on because I can't see anything anymore. So, let's see. So, first of all, thanks very much for that very nice introduction and um, for having me here. And it's very moving to hear about the uh, people who have been so instrumental in supporting and encouraging this uh, lecture series. Uh, I was reminded that actually I have been here once before in 1993. I vaguely remember coming um, and I, I, I said to uh, my friend and colleague here, Sister Deirdre, Dr. Mullen, I said, Deirdre, I think I was here once before, but I, I can't quite remember. <laughs> but I was, so in 1993 I was here. So, I'm enormously honored to have been invited to deliver the Robert L. Harris Memorial Lecture here at Sonoma State University. So my thanks to all of you for this honor, um, with special thanks to uh, Professors Myrna Goodman and Diane Parnas. I follow in the footsteps of some really wonderful scholars and teachers among whom are James Young, Claudia Stevens, Jerry Fowler, and Michael Berenbaum. You probably didn't hear most of them, but they've been here as part of this series. That's just to name a few of the Harris lecturers. They and, other, and others, in addition to Sonoma University's own professors, John Steiner, uh, Myrna Goodman, Diane Parnas, and others, make my task this afternoon rather daunting but I'll do my best to keep the bar high, as they say. So thus far this semester, you've had lectures. We'll see if this works. I, I thought I was gonna have a, a clicker like this, but we'll see if the, it, how this works for me. You've had lectures about anti-Semitism, war crimes, genocide in general, and the Armani Armenian and Bosnian uh, genocides in particular. And last week you had Dr. James Waller who shared with you insights into how and why people become evil. So the question is, do I have anything to add to what has already been said? Anything to say that has not been said? I hope so, of course. But it is a challenge to try to say something, if not new, at least complementary to what you've already heard. So my topic this afternoon is gender and genocide. But perhaps more correctly, it should have been titled Women and Genocide. For I do not intend to get into a discussion about genocide per se. I am not, for example, going to argue one way or another about the characteristics a, a society or culture uh, delineates as masculine or feminine, or how these understandings intersect with what we understand genocide to be. I trust it is, a, it is enough for me to say that gender refers to the socially constructed roles, behaviors, activities, and attributes that a given society considers appropriate for men and women. And sex refers to the biological and physiological characteristics that define men and women as such. While people in general, that is men and women, girls and boys, suffer the ravages of genocide, often the particularity of women's and girls' experiences during genocide are overlooked. So I want to draw your attention this afternoon to their experiences during war and genocide. Not because they suffer more or better than men and boys, but because for too long their experiences during genocide have been ignored, downplayed, considered one of the unfortunate but acceptable horrors of genocide, mass atrocities, and war. Now, what I want to do this afternoon. First, I want to begin by making some general comments about Raphael Lemkin and genocide. And then I want to say something 
about the concept and experience of exile, followed by some remarks about women during World War II and the Holocaust. Then I want to look at the use of rape as a weapon of war and genocide. And finally, I would like to make some concluding comments, leaving time for you to ask questions and for us to engage in some discussion. Along the way, I'll show some video clips and also provide you with a few references for your further reading and research about women and genocide. So then, what is genocide? It's as old as history, but it was only in 1944 that we finally had a word for it. That word, genocide, from the Greek genos, race, tribe, and the Latin, sede, killing, was coined by Raphael Lemkin, who lived, as you can see, between 1900 and 1959. He was a Polish Jew who was both a linguist and a lawyer. In March 1921, he saw a short news item about the assassination of Talat Pasha by a young Armenian man named Sogomen Tellerian in the Charlottenburg district of Berlin, Germany. In 1915, Talat Pasha, the former Turkish interior minister, had set out to rid what remained of the Ottoman Empire of the Armenian problem. He presided over the killing by firing squad, bayoneting, bludgeoning, and starvation of nearly one million Armenians. Sogomen Tellerian, a survivor of the Armenian genocide, had lost many members of his family and friends in that genocide. And his assassination of Talat was an act of retribution for what he, his family, and so many other Armenians had been made to suffer. Raphael Lemkin, at the time a student at the University of Lvov, was intrigued by the, assassin by the assassination of Talat Pasha. And he brought the case to the attention of one of his professors. He asked, this is um, um, Lemkin now, he asked why the Armenians had not had Talat arrested and prosecuted for massacre. The professor said there was no law under which he could be arrested. Do you mean, asked Lemkin, that it is a crime for the Armenian Tellurian to kill a man, but it is not a crime for the oppressor Talat Pasha to kill more than a million men? This is most inconsistent, he declared. In the 1930s, by then, Lemkin, a trained lawyer, was obsessed, one might say, with the Armenian genocide and the inconsistency in international law, that it made it possible to charge someone with the murder of one person, but not with the murder of a million people. At the same time, Lemkin was paying attention to what was happening in Europe, specifically in German, Germany where Adolf Hitler and the Nazis were on the ascent. By 1939, in Nazi Germany's invasion of Poland, Lemkin, like so many Jews in Poland, was scrambling either to flee or to stay and fight the Germans. At first, he stayed and fought in the defense of Warsaw, where he was wounded. Stay, staying gave him a chance to see firsthand what Nazi Germany was doing to the Jews and others and it was not good. To make a very long story short, Lemkin eventually fled to Sweden, then made his way to the United States where he managed to secure teaching jobs at Duke, Yale, and Rutgers Law Schools, all the while struggling with the inconsistency in international law that made it possible to prosecute someone for murdering one person, but not a million people. In November 1944, he published his book, Axis Rule and Occupied Europe, in which he used a new word that he had coined because he could not find another word to describe what he wanted to describe. It had happened to the Armenians at the beginning of the 20th century and was happening to the Jews of Europe 
during the late 1930s and into the 1940s. In a 1941 speech broadcast on the BBC, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill said, the whole of Europe has been wrecked and trampled down by the mechanical weapons and barbaric fury of Hitler and the Nazis. As his armies advance, whole districts are exterminated. We are in the presence of a crime without a name. In Axis Europe and occupied, in Axis rule and occupied Europe, Lemkin gave that crime a name, genocide. For years, he had been trying to bring together his views about what had happened to the Armenians and about the inconsistency of international law so that people like Talat Pasha could be held accountable under the law. His, his aim was to prevent future atrocities. Genocide, wrote Lemkin, was a coordinated plan of different actions aimed at the annihilation of a national of a national or ethnic group. After World War II and the Holocaust finally ended in 1945, Lemkin went on to lobby the member states of the fledgling United Nations, urging them to pass what today we know as the UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. Article II of the Convention defines genocide as a range of organized actions committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. The 1948 UN Convention on Genocide is very clear in its definition of genocide. In the present convention, genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. Killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, forcibly transferring members of the group to another group. I know, of course, that there is and has been much discussion about the pluses and minuses of the 1948 UN Convention of Genocide. And one can argue about whether or not it is inclusive enough. In fact, I have a MA student who's writing her master's thesis arguing that lesbian, gays, transgender, I forget the fourth category, should be included in, in the definition. So one can argue about this. And there's no doubt that Lemkin himself was not totally satisfied with the UN definition. Still, it is the definition that the member states agreed on, and it is the only legal definition we have for genocide. We owe our thanks to Raphael Lemkin for bringing us this far, even though we may want to go further. I'm, I want to show you a short, um, a very short video clip, if Sarah can get it on for, he, uh, for me. Um, this is a, a video clip that reminds us how this man, Raphael Lemkin, who gave his life for, for this notion of genocide and to get the UN to, to pass the Genocide Convention, he basically died forgotten. There were six people at his funeral when he died in New York. Okay, so this is very short. It'll take about two and a half minutes. <laughs> Raphael Lemkin was born on June 24, 1900, in Poland. His parents were both Jewish and they owned a farm where his mother schooled him. Lemkin later studied in France, Italy, and Germany, receiving a doctorate degree in philology in 1926. He was incredibly smart and was able to read 14 languages and speak nine. After leaving university, he decided to pursue a career in law. His first position was the secretary for the Court of Appeals in Warsaw. 
He rose swiftly through the ranks and soon became a prominent international figure. Lemkin is most famous for his dedication to the prevention of genocide. During his time in Warsaw, Lemkin studied the historic events that led up to the mass murder of Armenians during World War I and attempted to draft a proposal to deter and prevent such acts from ever happening again. In 1933, at the League of Nations Conference on Criminal Law, Lemkin put forth his completed proposal. It was an international document that would outlaw acts of barbarism and vandalism and protect minority populations. Lemkin was acutely aware of Hitler's developing schemes against European Jews, but at the time the Polish government was pursuing the policy of conciliation with Nazi Germany, and for his work, Lemkin was forced to resign. When Germany began invading Poland in 1939, Lemkin joined the Polish army to defend the city of Warsaw. He was wounded in the hip during the siege of the city, but evaded capture, living in the Polish forests for six months before escaping to Sweden. From there he made his way through Russia and across the Pacific to America, where with the help of friends he was able to find work teaching international law. It was during this time he began writing his most famous book, Axis Rule in Occupied Europe, in which Lemkin analysed the legal decrees that had allowed the Nazi occupation and identified the instruments that had worked to systematically eliminate Jews and other minorities. His analysis was used as one of the bases for determining the Nuremberg Trials Program in 1945, when he served as a legal advisor to the US Chief Prosecutor. At the end of World War II, he learned that some 40 members of his family, including his parents, had been killed in the Holocaust. It was only in 1948 that the United Nations adopted the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. It represented a triumph in the struggle that Lemkin had begun some 15 years earlier. For his work, Dr. Raphael Lemkin was twice nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize and was honored with a number of other awards. Lemkin died of a heart attack at the Public Relations Office in New York City. He was 59. In an ironic final push for a man whose life was dedicated to the remembrance of millions of victims of genocide, just seven people attended his funeral. I thought it was six, it was seven, still. Here was this man who was incredibly committed to humankind and he's remembered by seven people at the time of his death. Raphael Lemkin gave his life to the cause of bringing attention to genocide, that crime without a name. In 1939, Lemkin was forced into exile by, by the circumstances of World War II. He was a man who lived the rest of his life in exile in the United States of America. He died in exile, unheralded and forgotten by many at the time of his death. So my question is, what is exile? Exile is, a, is an experience of dislocation. One could even say that exile is an experience of violence. It is and has been the experience of multiple millions of people. Exile is the experience of humanity, which is the story of banishment, dislocation, and transplantation. It has been and is an experience of humanity from ancient times to the modern era. These last 114 years from 1900 until today, 2014, have been years that have witnessed large scale displacement and dispersal of populations across the world as the result of major political upheavals. From the Armenian genocide at the beginning of the 20th century to the genocidal conflicts in Africa, Asia, Central and South America, and Europe today. These conflicts and wars have resulted in widespread displacement of peoples, accelerating the transnational mobility of people either forcibly or voluntarily as refugees, as people in transit, as exiles, all of this has contributed to what the scholar Walter Brueggemann calls a deep dislocation in our society that touches every aspect of our lives. What does he mean? He means that the old certainties are less certain. The old dominations are increasingly ineffective and we seem to be not so clearly in charge. 
And he means that the old social fabrics of neighborliness are eroded into selfishness, fear, anger, and greed. Today I want you to think about exile in a slightly different way than simply as physical displacement, disconcerting and difficult as that may be. I would like you to think about exile as a metaphor for something deeper, something much more disturbing than being an outcast from one's own country, forced to live in another's country. I want you to consider exile as a sense of not being at home in your very self. Exile as living in a state of traumatic dislocation from your deepest self. Indeed, exile as not being at home in the universe. This lack of neighborliness and loss of trust in the world was nowhere more evident than in Europe during the Nazi era, World War II, and the Holocaust. The Holocaust was Nazi Germany's planned total destruction of the Jewish people and the actual murder of nearly six million Jews. This genocidal campaign, the most systematic, bureaucratic, and unrelenting ever, also destroyed millions of non-Jewish civilians because the Nazis believed their threat to the Third Reich approached, though it could never equal that posed by the Jews. The Holocaust contributed to the deep dislocation in our society that touches every aspect of our lives, and particularly our ordinary expectation of neighborliness, the expectation that the other human being, that other human beings will extend help to us in our need. As Jean Amory, a survivor of Auschwitz and Bergen Belsen writes, the expectation of help, the certainty of help, neighborliness, is one of the fundamental experiences of being a human being. It's what trust in the world is all about. Trust in the world includes all sorts of things, including the certainty that by reason of written or unwritten social contracts, the other person will spare me, more precisely stated, that he will respect my physical and with it also my metaphysical being. The boundaries of my body are also the boundaries of myself. My skin surface shields me against the external world. If I am to have trust, I must feel on it only what I want to feel. But as Jean Amri and millions of others during World War II and the Holocaust were to discover, trust in the world breaks down at the first blow. The other, uh, it breaks down when the other person, opposite whom I exist physically in the world, forces his own corporality on me with the first blow. He is on me and therefore, and thereby destroys me. It's like rape, a sexual act without the consent of one of the two partners. Let me repeat that. Trust in the world breaks down at the first blow. And that first blow, that violence is like rape, a sexual act without the consent of one of the two partners. Rape is so much more than sex, so much more than even violent sex. Rape is a violent invasion into the interior of a woman's body, and it represents the most severe attack imaginable upon the intimate self and the dignity of a human being. By any measure, it is a mark of severe torture. When a woman's inner space is violently invaded, it affects her in the same way torture does. In some societies, particularly patriarchal societies, women and girls who have suffered the indignity and horror of rape, whether in peacetime or in time of war, are rejected, ostracized, forced to live their lives on the margins of society indeed forced to live in exile. Think about women who have suffered the horrific experience of gender-specific violence in war and genocide. Consider, if you will, how that experience is both metaphysically, both metaphorically and actually a profound experience of personal and communal exile, an experience of losing trust in the world 
because the old social fabrics of neighborliness are not just eroded, but horribly and radically absent. Allow me now, if you will, to speak for a few minutes about gender crimes. By gender crimes, I mean hate crimes committed against a specific gender. Gender crimes are predominantly, though not always, committed against women. Specific gender crimes may include some instances of rape, genital mutilation, forced prostitution, and forced pregnancy. Gender crimes often are committed during armed conflict or during times of political upheaval or instability. Throughout the 20th century and into the 21st, from the Hereros in South and German Southwest Africa to the Armenians, the Ukrainian Kulaks, the Holocaust in Europe and the Americas, to East Pakistan, Cambodia, Nigeria, Central America, Burundi, Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Darfur. Gender crimes have been perpetrated time and time again on thousands upon thousands of women and girls. Interestingly enough, in a paper he presented at the 1996 Scholars Conference on the Holocaust in the Churches, the well-known genocide scholar Roger Smith argued that the Holocaust was atypical of 20th century genocide because it did not involve mass rape. But other scholars disagreed and disagree. The first major reports of Nazi mob rape were directed against Jewish women and occurred during Kristallnacht in 1938. And as Nazi Germany's soldiers marched through country after country, particularly Poland and the Soviet Union, they looted and raped, often singling out Jewish girls who sometimes were raped in front of their parents and siblings. According to Holocaust historian Doris Bergen, sexual violence is evident in many accounts of the Holocaust, from accounts of Jewish girls and women in hiding uh, 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 who were assaulted by their male rescuers to German soldiers conducting vaginal searches on Hungarian teenage Jewish girls before shipping them off to Auschwitz. If you want to read more about this, I su suggest you look at three books, all with excellent essays and lots of good references. Dagmar Herzog edited volume seven of the Lessons and Legacies a series that had the title The Holocaust in International Perspective. She also edited a second volume called Brutality and Desire, War and Sexuality in Europe's 20th Century. And Sonia Hedgepath and Rochelle G. Seidel, uh, their 2010 book, Sexual Violence Against Jewish Women During the, Ho uh, during the Holocaust, is another excellent resource if you're interested in reading more about this. The essays in this third book, the Hedgepeth and Seidel book, describe experiences of forced sex, sex for survival, prostitution, sterilization, abortion, and general sexual humiliation, and add greatly to what is known about the lives of Jewish women during World War II and the Holocaust. Gloria Steinem, the law, lifelong feminist, referring to Hedgepeth and Seidel's book, wrote that Holocaust horrors suffered by males and females alike have been rightly memori memorialized in histories and museums, but the sexual violence suffered by females has rarely been recorded. Perhaps we would have better been able to prevent the rapes in former Yugoslavia and the Congo, Stein, uh, Steinem writes, if we had not had to wait more than 60 years to hear the truths that are anthologized in sexual violence against Jewish women during the Holocaust. Sexual violence is a keystone of genocide. Another book I would suggest 
but it's not about Jewish women, but about non-Jewish German women in Berlin toward the end of World War II, as the Soviets were advancing from the east and other allies from the south and west, is the book entitled A Woman in Berlin, Eight Weeks in the Conquered City. The author of this book, who chose to remain anonymous for reasons any reader will understand after reading the book, tells in shocking and vivid detail of the mass rape to which women in that conquered city were subjected by Soviet army soldiers, officers, and enlisted men alike. The rapes committed in Berlin and its vicinity in 1945 against old women, young women, including barely pubescent girls, were acts of violence, an expression of revenge and hatred, a response by Soviet soldiers to the vast scale of casualties inflicted on them by the Germans. Listen to this short testimony, if, if uh, Sarah will put this on for us, the short testimony of one German non-Jewish woman who shares with us what happened to her. One night, seeking shelter for herself and her baby, Anna Zelik encountered a group of Red Army soldiers. Then came the Russian and found me in a beleuchted with Taschenlampe, not or Wasserlampe. And then came one and said, Frau, now you have a quartier. And this quartier was Luftschutzpunkte. Und in dem stand ein Tisch drin und in der Nacht kam ein Russe nach dem anderen und alle haben mich da auf dem Tisch vorgenommen. Da ist man wie tot. Der ganze Käfer ist wie verkrampft. Edel empfindet man da. Edel. Ich kann mich nicht anders ausdrücken. Das war doch alles gegen unseren Willen. Wir waren ja freiwillig für die. Das sind am Laufenden. Ich kann nicht sagen, 10, 15, jedenfalls das kam man nicht. Das sind viele, die hintereinander gekommen sind. Die haben nichts, einer weiß ich, der wollte auch, ich soll mich hinlegen und dann sagt er, wie viele Kameraden sind schon da gewesen, ziehen sie sich an. Даже если кого-то там убили, ну так, мало ли что, это же война. А подумай, про что я делал там, например, переспал солдат с какой-то женщиной там и девушкой. Вам необычно, когда слышите об этом? Ну, конечно, обидно, но обидно и не, не то, что обидно, обидно, так сказать, за то, что репутацию, какую наша страна получила. И с другой стороны, понимаете, и злоство на тех людей, которые так делали. Я, я, не подходит, я отрицательно, абсолютно отрицательно к этим людям отношусь. Абсолютно. It is estimated that as many as two million German women were raped by Red Army soldiers. Only a handful of Soviet soldiers were ever court-martialed for the offence. I hope you noticed the sort of smile on his face and the comment, well, it was war. 
I mean, he does say he was angry that the Soviets got this reputation, but it was war. And the comments about the soldiers, it was considered heroic, courageous, big deal. So how many women do you think the Russians raped in Berlin and the surrounding area? A thousand? Two thousand? Five thousand? Ten thousand? According to the distinguished British historian Anthony Beaver, who wrote the introduction to a woman in, a woman in Berlin, now this is in the area of Berlin, between 95,000 and 130,000 women were sexually assaulted. Although, to be honest, it has never been possible to calculate exact numbers. If one considers the total number of German rape victims in 1945, and the Soviets were not the only allied soldiers raping women and girls, we are looking at a figure estimated to be two million German women. This is in Germany. And this figure excludes Polish women and even Soviet women and girls brought to Germany for slave labor by the Wehrmacht. When it comes to World War II and the Holocaust, women suffered. And they suffered because they were women. Women suffered inside and outside the Nazi concentration and death camps, inside and outside the ghettos. Both Jewish and non-Jewish women suffered, even if one might argue they suffered unevenly, by which I mean to say that the Nazis intended to destroy all Jewish women. Well, that was not the case when it came to non-Jews, whether women or men. For too long, women were silenced by cultural taboos, silenced by irrational shame. I am thinking, for, exa for example, about the so-called comfort women, conscripted or kidnapped by the imperial Japanese government and forced to provide sexual satisfaction for their troops in the Pacific area of war, from the north of China, down the coast, and throughout Japanese-occupied areas during World War II. These are wom women we often forget about, so I want to show you another short video about one Chinese woman who, as a young girl, was forced into sexual slavery for the pleasure of Japanese soldiers. So, Sarah, can we do one more here? so-called comfort women. They were forced into sex slavery during the Second World War, and after that, into the shadows. Now they're finally telling their stories. The CBC's Michelle Cormier spoke with one of them. Lee <laughs> Hoon's life is an open wound, the relentless memory of being a sex slave to Japanese soldiers during the Second World War. She was only 15 when she was forced into a brothel run by the Japanese occupying army in Nanjing in 1943. At first, she tried to resist. She miraculously survived repeated rapes, but many others didn't. There were 200,000 Chinese women like her, forced into sex slavery by the Japanese army. 
Doctors made sure they were fit for their purpose. After the war, Lee Green married, but she could not have children. She saved an abandoned baby from starvation and adopted him. Today, Tang Jia Bo still lives with her. But all through those years, she could not bring herself to share her terrible secret until her husband was close to death. For decades, the story of the Chinese sex slaves remained largely forgotten. Many of the women themselves were too ashamed to talk about it. But now, as they near the end of their lives, these so-called comfort women want their plight to be known. The issue has been a contentious point between China and Japan for years, and it has flared up again recently after the new Japanese Prime Minister, Shinzo Abe, reneged on his government's acknowledgement of the military forcing Asian women into sex slavery. <laughs> Professor Zhu Jiliang of Shanghai has spent his career researching the issue. He found many of the surviving women. As long as Japan does not confront its war past, he says, as long as it refuses to apologize and to compensate the victims of the war brothels, it does not deserve a permanent seat at the UN Security Council. Despite her 79 years, Li Guying still comes from time to time to the place where her youth and dignity were stolen from her. The building has been torn down and replaced by a bank. But Li Guying still has a sketch she made of the broth. We check on the CDC News, Nanjing. We'll take a short break and come back with Claire Martin and your national web forecast. If you have any comments to share with us, you feel can. free to get, get in touch. Here's how you do it. Okay. Great. Thank you. So there you have another woman in another part of the world also suffering from um, gender crimes. Anthony Beaver, the British historian to whom I already referred, thinks the whole subject of rape and gender crimes in war is hugely controversial. But others, like Raphael Branch, think the category of gender is particularly useful and relevant for understanding the violence of war, with rape now clearly identified as a gendered war crime. Whether ignored or concealed for a long time, rapes were simply left out of most <coughs> war narratives. Except for a few cases in which rape was massive, and widespread, as in Nanjing in 1937, in Berlin in 1945, rapes were often simply not taken into account in historical narrative. The question, of course, is why? Was it simply because women were considered less than human to be done with as conquering males pleased? Or was it a kind of business as usual situation? a boys will be boys attitude? Or was it because military authority simply considered rape a banal form of torture, useful for, make, for making prisoners, male or female, talk? Perhaps historians just saw it as another one of the tools used in war and conflict to terrorize an occupied or conquered people. Whatever the reason, Today, gender is an accepted, useful, and relevant category for understanding the violence of war, with rape now clearly identified as a gendered war crime. 21 years ago, when John Roth and I published our book, Different Voices, Women During the Holocaust, Yugoslavia was bloodily disintegrating into six more or less ethnic enclaves. At the time, Roy Gutman, then European bureau chief for, the, for New York Newsday, was reporting on the Balkan War. 
Gutman was one of the first of the journalists to write about the widespread rape of women and girls in a country that only a few years earlier had been the site of the 1984 Winter Olympics, when thousands of people from around the world visited that most Western of Eastern Bloc countries, enjoying the hospitality and culture of the country and its people, particularly in that multi-ethnic city, Sarajevo. A year after different voices appeared, April 6, 1994, 20 years ago to this very week, genocide erupted in Rwanda, a tiny country in the heart of Africa that most of us had probably never heard of before we saw the horrifying images on television of people hacking other people to death with machetes, axes, hoes, and other lethal instruments. The genocide in Rwanda ran its course between April and July 1994. During that awful conflict, there was widespread rape of women and girls. Both former Yugoslavia and Rwanda were places where neighbors of long standing turned into killers, rapists, and torturers. Whether it was ideology or hate, madness or history or bloodlust, civilization's constraints vanished. In the 1990s, Yugoslavia was the featured presentation on the evening news, CNN, ABC, BBC, and Sky News, to name a few news outlets. For weeks and months, politicians, religious leaders, the United Nations, NATO, and the rest of us wrung our hands waiting for the other guy to do something about what was happening in Europe, a part of the world we thought was civilized, cultured, and had sworn off the horrors of ethnic cleansing and concentration camps after World War II, but we were mistaken. We also were mistaken about Rwanda, the most Catholic and the smallest country in Africa. Rwanda is called the land of a thousand hills, Hills define everything about this country located in Central Africa. In April 1994, Rwanda erupted into a frenzy of killing. Thousands upon thousands of peoples picked up their machetes and slashed their friends, neighbors, and sometimes members of their own family to death. Somewhere between 800,000 to a million people, mostly ethnic Tutsi, but also moderate ethnic Hutu, died in this four-month-long genocide, which only ended once the RPF, the Rwandan Patriotic Front, largely made up of exiled Tutsi, finally won control of the country. If you want to read more about both these horrors, Yugoslavia and Rwanda, I suggest Elizabeth Neufer's book, The Key to My Neighbor's House, a heartbreaking, blood-chilling, sometimes even inspiring account of these genocides. There are other books you could read as well. For example, Samantha Powers, she's the UN ambassador now, as you all probably know. Samantha Powers, Pulitzer Prize winning, A Problem from Hell, America and the Age of Genocide, and Adam Labour's Complicity with Evil, The United Nations and the Age of Modern Genocide, these are two good books I would recommend to you. Very accessible to the, um, to the reader, well documented and uh, clearly argued. Over the centuries, the violent act of war and the violent act of rape have been linked together in a deadly dance. And no more, nowhere more so than in former Yugoslavia and Rwanda in the 1990s. There, rape became a weapon used to terrorize, punish, and degrade women of specific ethnic groups. How and why, you might ask, did the bodies of women and girls become the battlefield on which men fought their wars? In both Rwanda and Yugoslavia, ethnicity is derived from one's father. In Yugoslavia, if your father is a Bosnian Muslim, or an Orthodox Christian Serb, 
or a Roman Catholic Croat, you are a Bosnian Muslim, a Serb Orthodox Christian, or a Roman Catholic Croat. It does not matter what your mother's ethnic origins may be. In Rwanda, if your father is Tutsi, you are Tutsi. If he is Hutu, you are Hutu. It does not matter if you are the offspring of an ethnically uh, mixed marriage. You belong to your father's ethnic group. During the vicious conflict in former Yugoslavia, Bosnian men deliberately set out to get Mus Muslim women pregnant in an effort to dilute the ethnic group. The same was true in Rwanda, where extremist Hutu genocidaires deliberately, wantonly, and with fury raped Tutsi women and girls. No one knows exactly how many women and girls were raped in either former Yugoslavia or Rwanda during these genocides, but Vesna Perik Zamanjic reports that in Yugoslavia, up to 50,000 women and girls were raped there. And in Rwanda, the organization Stop Rape Now estimates that between 250,000 and 500,000 women, overwhelmingly from the Tutsi minority, were raped during the four months of genocide there. The massive rape in former Yugoslavia and Rwanda in the 1990s wasn't like rape during other wars, World War II, for example. It wasn't like the rape made possible by the Imperial Japanese Army Command after they established those so-called comfort houses for the pleasure of Japanese soldiers in the, in the wake of the rape of Nanking and trafficked women and girls from across Asia to locations all over Japanese-controlled Asia-Pacific during the war. Nor was it like the widespread rape in Berlin in 1945 as World War II was winding down and thousands of women were raped by victorious Soviet soldiers and other allied soldiers as well. No, it was something different. It was not rape as a byproduct, a side effect, a kind of, well, boys will be boys, war action. It was rape as an action that was deliberate, purposeful, and strategic. It was rape used as a military tactic to achieve an objective or objectives. It was rape used with purpose to shame and demoralize women, to tear communities apart, and to control populations. It was rape used as a weapon in a new kind of warfare, warfare in which men use their sexual organs like they use their guns, grenades, and machetes to maim and destroy, to spread terror and death, and to leave something behind, unwanted babies. Rape in these wars had little to do with sex, and everything to do with power, domination, and destruction. Rape has become widespread in war and genocide because it is so effective. In cultures that see women as the property of a man, as was the case in Rwanda and Yugoslavia, both solidly traditional patriarchal societies, violating women was an indirect Let's see here if I have the right one up here. Oh, yeah, okay. Violating women was an indirect yet potent way of attacking and violating male enemies. One of the great ironies of war is that when a man is injured, he is a hero. But when a woman is raped or mutilated because of rape, she is more likely hidden or an object of shame. And as you probably know, widespread rape of women during war and conflict did not cease with the end of the genocide in Rwanda in July 1994. It continues today in places like Darfur, Syria, and Congo, to name but a few places. Listen to this exchange that I quote in just a moment here about rape in Congo. This is an exchange between Anderson Cooper, the well-known CNN correspondent, 
and Anika van Woudenberg, the senior Congo researcher at Human Rights Watch. Here's the exchange. Cooper says this, women get raped in wars all the time. How is it different here in Congo? And the woman, uh, Anika van Woudenberg answers, I think what's different in Congo is the scale and the systematic nature of it, as well as the brutality. This is not rape because soldiers have got bored and have nothing to do. It is a way to ensure that communities accept the power and authority of that particular armed group. This is about showing terror. This is about using rape as a weapon of war, she explains. Slavanka Drukulic, a Croatian journalist and author of S, a novel about the Balkans, writes, sexual She writes in this book of S, she says, sexual violence is an extremely effective weapon. It not only shames violated women, it also humiliates their men who cannot protect them. Sexual violence destroys the whole community because it, the stigma stays with them, not forgotten, not forgiven. Major General Patrick Com Comert, the former commander of the United Nations Peacekeeping Force in Eastern Congo said, rape is a very effective weapon because the communities are totally destroyed. You destroy communities, you punish the men, and you punish the woman doing it in front of the men. I think he also said that Congo is the most dangerous place in the world for a woman. So what happens to a woman when she is raped raped in circumstances of this kind in places like Congo or Darfur or Syria or other places? What happens to a woman who has not been raped but who is made to watch another woman or women being raped? How do these experiences affect these women, both, both primary and secondary victims of rape, sexual mutilation, or sexual violence generally? In an essay she wrote about the war in former Yugoslavia, Susan Brown Miller had this to say, sexual trespass on the enemy's woman, women is one of the satisfactions of conquest, but it leaves women feeling doubly dehumanized as woman, as enemy. And in that one act of aggression, the collective spirit of women and of the nation is broken. All those certainties of who they are as women, wives, mothers, grandmothers, protected and secure within their homes, neighborhoods and communities, agents of their own destiny, even if subordinate to their husbands, is shattered. They become evidence of the enemy's bestiality, symbols of the nation's defeat, pariahs, damaged property, not to mention victims, dehumanized and intensely traumatized. One psychiatrist working with rape victims in former Yugoslavia reported that rape victims' feelings of humiliation, disgrace, and impotence are the reason they even now respond only rarely to offers of psychological or psychiatric help and seldom ask for help on their own initiative. If they do come forward, they try to remain anonymous and avoid being labeled as rape victims. How shattering. How agonizing, how painful, how dislocating is that? Not even to be able to say I when speaking about an experience that has violated the boundaries of one's own body, one's own self. In Rwanda, during the 1994 genocide, rape was the rule and the absent, absence the, and, and its absence, the exception. 
Rape was intended to put women through untold agony and effectively destroyed their hopes for a bright future. Many women became pregnant, contracted HIV AIDS, or suffered other consequences as a result of their ordeal. Those who bore children in the aftermath of the genocide have had to live with and raise these children of bad memories. It is not uncommon that when a women, woman reveals the truth about the origin of her child, she faces rejection by her family and loses support from the community, which harbors deep emotional scars from the genocide. Jean Amory said that the Holocaust destroyed trust in the world. If the Holocaust destroyed trust in the world, post-Holocaust genocide have surely reinforced that destruction. I doubt that there is anything or anybody who will be able to repair a woman's sense of trust in the world, even a fragile sense of trust, after she has been viciously and sexually assaulted. What do place and belonging mean in an age when so many people are on the move all over the globe? What does home mean? What does a sense of being at home in the universe mean to a woman or girl whose most intimate self has been profoundly violated? I have one more video here that I want to show you if Sarah will put this up. I want you to think about these questions as you watch this very short video that's just about four and a half minutes long. They find us in the fields as we plant. They find us by the river as we fetch water. They find us in the forest as we collect wood. They are the nameless, faceless bandits, rebels, military. They abuse our bodies, take our souls, empty our guts, then throw us away. We are the trash they leave behind in their wars. We are the silent ones we see by the side of the road. The ones once called mother, sister, wife, daughter. We are the ones discarded by husbands. We are used up, defiled by other men, dirty, unwanted, unseen, unheard, undone. We are the battleground, the ammunition in a war, never seen, never heard, felt, only by us. Throughout the world, wherever there is conflict, women, girls and babies are subjected to unimaginable terror. This terror comes not from the bullet or the bomb, but from the threat of sexual violence, a weapon of war that has now reached epidemic proportions.
Tens of thousands of women were raped during the war between 1992 and 1995. Many held captive for weeks or months, facing daily assaults. Cijelo živote ću se sjećati i osjećati istu bol koju sam tada osjetila i još uvijek osjećam. To nikada neće nastati. Spoken. During the 2011 Libyan War, Emma Al Obeidi stated she was gang raped by Gaddafi soldiers. In a society where sex crimes are taboo, she'd broken the silence of what was being used as a weapon of war. Recordings of rape were also found on mobile phones opposition fighters claimed they confiscated from Gaddafi loyalists. We were able to confirm that rape was used as a weapon of war because it was systematic. These atrocities, of course, did not begin, nor have they ended in Libya. The United Nations estimates that during the Bosnian War, between 20 to 50,000 women were raped. In the Sierra Leone War, the figure is even higher with up to 64,000 victims. In Rwanda, it's estimated that half a million women were raped during 100 days of conflict in 1994. And in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the UN says health centers report 40 women are raped each day in the conflict zone. Yet there has been little justice prompting a growing number of people to speak out. So let me try to come to a, some sort of a conclusion by asking a question. But let me tell you about what I do. I teach st students at the Richard Stockton College of New Jersey about the Holocaust and genocide. Among the books we read is Iris Chang's The Rape of Nanking. One of the issues I always discuss with students is the fact that Japan was, perhaps still is, a male-dominated society. I draw attention to what Chang has to say about how the molding of young men to serve in the Japanese military began early in life, and how in the years prior to the beginning of the Second Sino-Japanese War in 1937, the Japanese soldier was not simply hardened for battle in China, he was hardened for the task of murdering Chinese combatants and non-combatants alike. We look at documentary films about the orgy of cruelty perpetrated on Chinese men, women, and children by the Imperial Japanese military when they invaded Nanjing, the capital of China at the time. The battle for Nanjing was followed followed a particularly tough fight at Shanghai, where Chinese forces had put up stiff resistance against the Japanese army, which overall had expected an easy victory in China. We read about how an estimated 20 to 80,000 women were raped in Nanjing and its surrounding area. And we discuss how many soldiers of the Imperial, Imperial Japanese Army went beyond rape to disembowel women, slice off their breasts, and nail them alive to, wall, to walls. Now for a question. Are women human, I ask? What a crazy question, students answer. When we study World War II and the Holocaust, I sometimes have students read Konetsnik's nightmare novel, House of Dolls. It describes a day's routine in a nameless brothel in which young Jew Jewish women, under threat of death, are forced to prepare their cots for the arrival of German soldiers who do enjoyment duty, and then, after raping the women, write reports about the performance of their dolls. Other times, I use sections of A Woman in Berlin, the journal kept by that anonymous 
German Gentile woman I told you about, who lived through the Russian conquest of Berlin as World War II was drawing to an end in Europe and hordes of Soviet soldiers raped German women with wild abandon. Are women human, I ask. What a stupid question, students say. Of course women are human. I go on to draw their attention to Bangladesh. Most of them do not even know where in the world Bangladesh is. So I have to use lots of maps to help them locate it in South Central Asia. Even less do they know about the extreme and systematic violence that precipitated the creation of Bangladesh, an event largely neglected by genocide scholars. In 1971, during a period of about nine months, Pakistani soldiers raped between 200,000 and 400,000 women. No one knows exactly how many, but thousands of those raped women became pregnant. From Bangladesh, I moved back to Europe, to the former Yugoslavia in the 1990s, although there could have been many stops in, along the way. Indonesia, Cambodia, Burundi, Guatemala, Sierra Leone, Liberia, East Timor, among other places. But there's only so much time and all too few classes in a semester to cover the ever-growing problem of rape used as a weapon of war and genocide in our fractured and fragile world. Are women human, I ask. What kind of question is that, responds one young man. Of course women are human. It's self-evident, he says. Indeed, I say. But Catherine McKinnon thinks that answer is too easy, too problematic, and so do I. I remind him, as well as the entire class, what McKinnon says. If women were human, would we be a cash prop shipped from Thailand in containers into New York brothels? Would we be sexual and reproductive slaves? Would our genitals be sliced out to cleanse us, to control us, to mark us out and define us and define cultures? Would we be trafficked as things for sexual use and entertainment worldwide in whatever form current technology makes possible? Would we be raped in genocide to terrorize and eject and destroy our ethnic communities? If women were human, would our violation be enjoyed by our violators? And if we were human when these things happen, would virtually nothing be done about it? McKinnon's list of outrages, past and present, goes on and on. Her rhetoric is grim, but effective. Inequality on the basis of gender is a pervasive reality of women's lives all over the world. So is sex-related violence and vulnerability to rape in times of war and genocide. The simple question, are women human, can lead us to see more clearly a male-dominated world that long has tolerated, condoned, and even encouraged gender-based violence and abuse. When we consider the use of rape as a weapon of war and genocide, more, no question is more important than are women human. How we encourage and enable each other to develop, or at least to begin to develop, genuine and real attitudes of humane equality toward and about women and girls during peacetime will have an impact on the attitudes and behaviors exhibited by men and boys toward women and girls during times of extreme violence. Because the extreme violence that they suffer during war and genocide does not arise solely out of the conditions of conflict. It is directly related to the attitudes of men, the young and the not so young, the attitudes they have toward women and girls in peacetime. Let me read for you from Monday's Wall Street Journal that I picked up in the hotel last night or the day before, uh, yesterday I think when I came in. This is a, an op-ed piece by Paul Kagame. You all know who Paul Kagame is, right? The president, of, the current president of Rwanda. Here are two short quotes. 
The first, all genocides begin with an ideology, a system of ideas that says, this group of people here, they are less than human, and they deserve to be exterminated. Second quote, to prevent genocide, it is not enough to remember the past. We must also remember the future. All forms of violence against women are related. We must, we must challenge the political and ideological structures that still legalize any form of violence against women and girls anywhere in the world. That any uh, ideological or political structures that demean and dehumanize them in any way whatsoever. If we hope to eradicate violence against women in the 21st, 21st century, all of us, women and men alike, must be able to see in our vision of humanity a woman's face. Thank you. Just about three or four weeks ago, Dr. John Roth, um, who has lectured here, I believe, on more than one occasion, um, John and I uh, organized a working seminar of scholars from six countries. So it wasn't a conference, it was a working seminar. Um, it was evenly divided between men and women. Um, there were eight men and eight women. Um, scholars from Hungary, Switzer, uh, Switzerland, um, Sweden, the UK, Germany, the US, uh, on uh, teaching about rape as a weapon of war and genocide. And so um, what we did was we struggled with how do you teach about this to, uh, now obviously to undergraduates and graduates, it, probably not an appropriate topic unless in the detail in which, uh, for example, I would teach about it or others might teach about it. Um, and so we had, for example, Henry Terrio, who's a scholar in Armenia who has dealt with um, sexual violence during the Armenian genocide. Elisa von Jürgen Forgi, who actually is my colleague at the Richard Stockton College of New Jersey. Uh, who has written about uh, rape as a weapon of war and genocide. So it was very exciting. We had it at Campion Hall, which is one of the six permanent residents uh, in Oxford. And so it was two and a half days of intense collegial uh, discussion. There was no posturing. Nobody said, look how smart I am. I'm smarter than you are. <laughs> it was very unusual for a group of scholars. It was, very, it was a very uh, intense, exciting. Uh, seminar, and we hope to get some publications out of it. Yes, please. Dr. Rittner, what you've had to say, I'm sure, has affected everybody. Uh, some of it was very new to me, some of it wasn't. I know that students can leave here feeling very hopeless, helpless. How do they, as young people, affect anything like this? Are there organizations? I know there are organizations that are working to not only prevent this, but also to administer aid to women who've experienced it. And do you know someone? Well, let me start with the question of what can we do? Um, I think all of us, men and women, um, we can make sure that if uh, jokes, comments, uh, insults are aimed at women, uh, that we stand, it's not right, I don't think that's funny. And of course we need men to do that um, as much of, as uh, we need women to do it. Uh, so I think that we can all start by not being bystanders. That's the, the first question, uh, the first thing that we can do. 
There are organizations, you can go on to the internet and um, Google, uh, there, there's a wonderful man's organization that is really uh, devoted to um, like helping young men to develop healthy attitudes toward women and girls and um, their own sexuality. Um, so that's something else, I mean, you can look at that. I'd say in fraternities and sororities. Um, wouldn't it be great if the, if the Greek societies on campus, I assume you have Greek societies, um, if you really had a take back the night and you walked with the women and you really educated yourself. I mean, if, if the young men I, and the women here stood up because when we did the seminar at, uh, in Oxford a few weeks ago, I, I, I said to John, this cannot be a, a seminar of all women. This has to be, a, men have to be there. They have to deal with this issue as well. Um, so, and we can uh, do things like you did. You have people like me come in and at least begin to talk about these issues. I'm sure, you, as you say, you know some of this, some of it's new to you. And there's much more that, of course, can be said. Um, so those are some things that I, I could suggest that, yes. Excellent. That's that's one. And I, I mean, what do you think? What do you think can be done? You know, um, what what do you folks, as you sit here and, and listen to this, what do you, what do you think about can be done? Well, let, let me get some of these young people in here to come on. Don't be shy. Oh, you can't be that shy now, really. You must something must be going through your head more than just let's see. It's a quarter to six and almost time for this class to be over. This, this can be done. I, I'd love to know what, what, do, the, what do the young men think? What, what do you think can be done? Uh, I mean, any, any, all of you are gonna go out into the world of work. And if there are situations where, um, you know, there are uh, unwritten policies, policies that sort of, um, I don't know, marginalize women. I mean, what, what do you do about stuff like that? What do you do about jokes? I think jokes are the, the big thing. When you start making jokes about women or, um, you know, using language that demeans women. Yes? Absolutely. <laughs> do it all the time. <laughs> and one of the things that one of the things that uh, Professor Parnas didn't say is I I also happen to be uh, a professional religious. I'm a Roman Catholic nun, a Sister of Mercy, and uh, believe me, I I understand exactly the point that you're making. And um, I mean, it gets to the point now where I just simply. I mean, it's not to the point now. I've been a long time. I tell these priests and others what I think. Um, and so I, I agree with you. I mean, it's, we've, and we, I just read an article in the paper about Mormon women. Did you see that in today's paper? Mormon women wanting to be admitted into leadership positions in the Mormon church. So it's not just the Roman Catholic Church, it's others. Uh, it's other religious traditions as well, but you're absolutely correct, so thank you for bringing that up. Other comments, questions? Yes, please. Are the babies that are born with the rapes of here abandoned? Yes, they are, and sometimes they're killed. Um, and uh, there is a, I mean, th think about that. I mean, think about a woman who, I mean, I look, I'm, I'm not advocating for abortion or whatever, but th th think about, about a woman who's forced to give birth to a child that, first of all, she doesn't know who the father is. I mean, if she's been raped by many different men, and then, I mean, what do you do? 
do, I mean, they have been abandoned in Rwanda, for example, in former Yugoslavia, I'm sure in Germany, there are people in Germany, I'm sure, who don't really know who their fathers are. I mean, maybe their mothers never told them, you know, your father was killed in the war, whatever. Um, but it's, I mean, I think it's a trauma. And, and there is research, a woman named Charlie Carpenter, who at the time was at the University of Pittsburgh, and now I think is at Amherst, but I'm not sure. But um, Charlie Carpenter did a, a lot of work. She, I think she had a Ford Foundation grant, did a, a lot of work about these uh, um, babies of rape. And um, so I'm, I'm not as tuned in, uh, tuned up, let me put it that way, on the research. I mean, a while ago I was reading her stuff, but it's been a while since I've read it, but that's a good place to start. Uh, there's also, there was a, and I think you can see it online, there was a wonderful exhibition, a photographic exhibition done about Rwandan mothers and their children, and these photographs with the story of the mother. Um, so if you were to put in like Rwanda, Rwandan mothers with unwanted children. The, the exhibition might come up. It was made into a book, and I keep, I'm blanking on the pho photographer's name. But So there, there is research. There, are, there is literature on that. Others? Questions? Comments? Oh, sorry. Excuse me. I'm remembering that Ambassador Matilda Mukadavana was with us two weeks ago. And so much of the work in Rwanda um, and of that government has been to try to learn from what other countries have experienced and particularly their outreach to the orphan children and the women and, their, and the children of rape. And I'm wondering how we support that work and help in disseminating what's been learned about the healing process. It's a Excellent question. I mean, I, 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 I don't, I don't really question. know, but I think it's a question. It's a question to her um, that she might be able uh, to suggest a response to that question. But I do know there are organizations. I mean, imagine these children now in Rwanda, for example, are 18, 19, 17, whatever. Um, I mean, it's. I don't know what I would do or how I could do it, you know? After the genocide was over, it's estimated that 70% of the population of Rwanda was women. And the ambassador told us that 68% of their legislature right, is a, women. A very high percentage of women in so the... So perhaps they might be working towards some sort of... And, and the UN, the uh, UNICEF might... International Red Cross uh, might be a good place to go to look. Um, a world uh, human rights w watch, uh, World Jewish Services right. might be another good place. Um, so, yes, please. I, I, don't, I don't have those statistics, but I am sure that you could search through the literature and begin to get some, um, uh, some estimate. But, uh, you know, we always think about the Soviets as uh, the widespread rapes, but um, the Americans and the French also, not as, not as much. And, and interestingly enough, from what I've read, the Brits did the least of it. Now, it may have been because of their, their lines of command, uh, you know, and, and I, I don't know, but, um, but, it, but we don't really talk about that stuff, just like we don't talk about it in Vietnam during the war there. Um, I mean, be very interesting to know in Afghanistan and Iraq. I, it's hard for me to imagine that there's been nothing, you know, um, Well, thank you very much. Thank you.